Welcome back to Yahoo Finance. Continuing our discussion on music royalties, are they a way to recession-proof your portfolio, or is it just a flashy investment that could end up leaving you with taxes to pay off with those royalty yields? Joining us to discuss the pros and cons of music investing, we've got Michael McCune, the Chief Investment Officer at Markham Wealth, and we're also joined by Clayton Durant. He's the founder of CAD Management. That's a music management and entertainment consulting firm. Guys, great to have both of you on. Thanks for coming in. Michael, I want to start with you. What would you say is the single biggest factor that an investor should consider when sussing out whether or not this is a good investment? Yes, I think the number one thing to look at is cash flow because these are contractual obligations for a catalog or a song. But investors need to think about how much are they getting paid relative to other options in the marketplace, whether other bonds, treasury bills at five and a half percent, and then also what are the tax consequences because an eight percent potential yield really may be four or five percent after taxes when you're in a higher tax bracket and state. And Michael, we've been talking a lot about the Shrek soundtrack, how you can invest in that. That's sort of what inspired this segment. If your client came to you with that, what do you think? Is that a good investment? Well, you know, I think it, com it comes down to is a client's financial plan include private credit as an asset class within the, a portfolio, right? Private credit is probably about 1% of the tr hundreds of trillions of dollars that you could invest in inside of private credit is royalties. And that's probably 1% of that. So I think it comes down to sizing and really what the client's risk tolerance and overall objectives are. And private credit, alternative assets, such a mega trend right now. But Clay, I wanna bring you into the conversation. You know the music space so well here. What would you say is the biggest misconception about music royalties? Well, I think the first thing investors need to understand is what side of the royalties are they actually investing in? So for every song that you stream on Spotify, there's two underlying copyrights. First is the performing arts copyright, which is essentially the composition, right? Your lyrics, the melody, and all of that. That has its own ecosystem of royalties. Royalties. The second copyright that exists is the sound recording. So that's your master that you actually listen to. So depending on what you're actually investing in, you have to consider those different types of royalties. Now, some of the uh, big catalog sales that you've probably covered, the hypnosis songs funds of the world, the round hill capitals, and all of them, they're actually investing mostly in the publishing. So that's the composition side. And there's a reason for that, uh, because most of the time, most of the value is actually concentrated within the publishing area, uh, particularly around the mechanical license and the fact that for every composition, there can be multiple masters around that. So there is a lot of expansion opportunity to own the actual publishing rather than owning the master. And most of the uh, investment that you're seeing for your average retail investor is actually on the master side. So the yield is going to be a little bit different depending on what area uh, you're actually getting to invest in. And Clay, the good thing for investors is there's a lot of public data out there when it comes to music. Is there a single data point that investors should be really focused on, like, TikTok plays, Spotify streams, when trying to determine the ROI of a song? So again, like it depends what area you're actually getting to invest in, but I think a common synergy between both copyrights is the syncability of a song. It's a little bit of a qualitative insight, but you really need to understand where can this song go and get licensed? It, can it be in an advertisement? Can it be in a theme park? Can it be in all these other spaces? And I think that once you've been able to wrap your head around, okay, where can this song actually go and get placed? The ability to actually go and get new fans to stream and consume that song will actually lift both areas of the copyright, no matter what area you depended, uh, that you actually own. Mm -hmm. So. I think that's a really big consideration that you have to think about not only is what's the syncability, but what's the overall marketability of that catalog that you own. And that's a really big question that these really big investors who are buying these rights for multi millions of dollars are asking themselves. They have to say, hey, how much can I actually increase this catalog and how can I get new fans who may have never heard of a Bruce Springsteen before to get involved and actually listen to his back catalog? And the same question needs to be asked from a retailer investor side. Can they actually go and get people to actually stream a new song? And I think for the Shrek catalog in particular, that's going to be tough unless you actually get the original IP for the movie in different areas and different places because realistically they're very correlated together. And there's, to me, I'm not sure how much syncability and how much marketability there is outside of that movie IP that surrounds it. 
So given that background, Michael, what would you say the percentage allocation should look like for an investor, specifically not just to all assets, but to music royalties in particular? Yeah, I mean, I think it really comes down to, like I said, the larger picture. How does private credit fit in somebody's portfolio? And thinking about the overall risks that Clayton talked about. For example, you know, an artist could have the rights well within you know, their recording uh, ability to re-record the, their album, like Taylor Swift mm -hmm. we saw, correct? That has a risk on your cash flows that you may not have thought about before. By the way, Taylor's version for me, of course. <laughs> yeah, of course. But, um, but I, I would say most likely a modest percentage is is really what uh, is is what we're thinking about. I think if any, uh, if it's appropriate. And if I can add on to that point, right? Her re-recorded version of that actual song, the, if you own the publishing of that, you would still get paid on the actual re-recording, right? Oh, Which goes yeah. back to the point of no matter what you're investing in, really understand what area of the copyright you actually own. And I think if you're very clear on that, you can get a much better uh, understanding of whether the investment is going to be really strong long term or not. And there are a few uh, publicly traded music royalty funds out there that are open to investors like Hypnosis Songs Fund, Mills Music Trust. Can you explain the difference there? And is that a better play than perhaps investing in a particular song or catalog? Well, I think investing in a particular song or catalog, you have to do a ton of due diligence, which I'm sure is you know on your side of things. But um, I was recently at a uh, panel uh, at Luminate, and they spoke about the amount of money that it takes to do due diligence. And look, these reports that come around the world and all these different royalty streams take a lot of people to actually go and dig through the data. And it takes a lot of money to be able to go and do that. And I don't think that the average investor has the capability or maybe the knowledge set to accurately go and do that. Now, if you go and invest with, the, let's say, a hypnosis, I think that might be a better bet because they have a huge swath of actual catalogs right. that span different genres. I mean, for, for hypnosis in particular, right? They own Shakira. They own uh, a variety of different uh, catalogs in different genres, which means they're pretty uh, uh, wide in terms of um, you know, uh, the, the consumption trends that are happening. Um, so I think. Uh, if I were on the uh, on the investing side, I would probably spend more of my money on a hypnosis and investing there rather than trying to take the chance on one bespoke catalog. Unless, again, you have something incredible like a Michael Jackson catalog. But again, th there right now there isn't a sort of retail investor market to own a, even a fractional piece of something that valuable. Most of those catalogs are going to the companies that you just mentioned. Well, hypothetically then, Let's talk about your investment portfolios when it comes to the music side of things. Michael, who are you picking? What's your favorite track? Well, I mean, an all-time classic. It's got to be Journey, Don't Stop Believing. Mm. I mean, nostalgic, <laughs> the longevity. Always I at mean, a wedding. I mean, <laughs> if, if you're not playing that song at the end of a wedding or a party or a bar, I mean, yeah. you're doing it wrong, right? I, absolutely. Play. <laughs> I, I think for me, like, the Latin music boom has been absolutely incredible. Uh, the RIAA, uh, you know, showed that Latin music actually grew to a billion plus dollars this yeah. year in the U.S. And I think that really speaks the volumes in terms of the actual value that can be unlocked with Latin music. So I'd bet pretty big on Latin, you know, both catalog Latin that, you know, from the Shakira uh, era all the way to, you know, possibly of trying to get involved with artists like Bad Bunny. And I think there's a lot of value to be unlocked there. Um, and if you can take that uh, opportunity, that would be somewhere I would take a look at. All right, I'm waiting for Taylor Swift. I mean, she's I the moment right now. So <laughs> I think I'd, I'd, I'd go for her, but we'll have to wait and see. Uh, Michael McEwen, thank you so much, along with Clay Durant. Appreciate all of your insight.